three, two, one. What's up, young adults? My name is Sam. I get to be one of the Palmetto Bay Young Adult Directors here. And man, we are starting into our second week of shook, shocking statements from Jesus. And the statement that we're going to be looking at today is made in Matthew 7, verse 7. So I want to read that for you guys really quick. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we really jump into this. Father God, thank you for everything you've done for us in our lives, Lord. Thank you for sending your Son and giving us your peace and your joy and your love and everything else through him and your Holy Spirit, Father God. I pray that you would guide us through this message and that it can be edifying to us and that we can walk away better than what we were before. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Man, so what is one thing that you have asked for that you that you received? Was it something great? Was it something silly? Was it something simple? Maybe something complex? Maybe it's something you've been wanting your entire life. Was it given to you? How did you get it? Who gave it to you? There's a, there's a silly example that I can give from my own life. It was back in middle school. We were going to do this Pocahontas musical. I know <laughs> Pocahontas is kind of funny. I know it's, it's a Disney movie. It's an actual story that happened. You know, all these different things. But for us in middle school, if you were a guy in this musical, you fell into one of two categories. And it, it, it kind of sucked. But it was if you were fit, if you were an athlete, you became one of the Indians. And if you weren't, and you were kind of chubby like I was in middle school, you became one of the pilgrims, one of the settlers, right? So I did not want to be a settler, but I didn't necessarily want to be an Indian either. And I knew that the, 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 the musical that we were doing, the rendition of the musical that we were doing was the one that was following the Disney movie. So in my head, I was like, but wait, no one's the raccoon. No one is Miko. I wonder if my teacher will let me be Miko. So I remember walking up to my teacher, Mr. Bennett, one day during lunch, and I said, hey, Mr. Bennett, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah, what's up? And I was like, I don't really want to be a pilgrim. He's like, do you want to be one of the Indians? I said, no, I don't want to be one of the Indians either. He says, okay, well, who do you want to be in this play? I said, I want to be the raccoon. And he just looked at me bewildered. And he says, you want to be the raccoon? And I was like, yes, I want to be the raccoon. I want to be Miko. And he's like, he doesn't have any lines. I was like, exactly. I don't want to really do this. Like, I don't want to be a pilgrim. I don't want to be an Indian. I do want to sing in this, in this musical and we all have to sing, but I don't really want to have any lines. And he's like, okay, fine. And this is what left me shook. You can do it if you can produce the costume. And I was like, I'm in. So my mom and my grandmother worked tirelessly for two whole weeks to come up with this Miko costume, with this raccoon costume. And it was amazing because as a sixth grader with my sister being two grades ahead of me, when I came into middle school, everyone knew me as, as, oh, you're Sarah's little brother. And after this play, the role kind of reversed and no one really knew who I was, but they knew me as Miko and they knew my sister. And everyone started calling my sister Miko's sister. And that was amazing. That was really kind of cool. But it was just the simple fact that I asked my teacher I sought it out. I knocked on the. I, kn- I knocked on his door and he opened it. And I was, I was shook that he was like, "Yeah, sure, here you go, you can have it." That's kind of what we're getting into today with this passage. Okay, what I really need you guys to understand is this: if you walk away with anything, okay, is this shocking statement: Jesus will give you whatever you ask for. Jesus will give us whatever we ask for. And that is a shocking statement because we look at it and we're saying, hold on, wait, is there any type of like condition to this? Is there a caveat? What's going on? And I need you guys to understand this. This isn't some type of prosperity preaching. This isn't, you know, a genie in a bottle type deal, but this is just going based off of what it is. So there's a couple questions that we're going to have to ask first and to really look at, you know, is Jesus actually going to give us this or why, why, why are we doing this? So these are the questions. Why are we asking, seeking, and knocking? And the second one, how can we be confident that God will respond to our requests? These are two really important questions to really, these are two important questions to really understand why Jesus is going to give us these things. So I want to, I want to look at this first. Why are we asking, seeking, and knocking? Because we have a need. We ask, we seek, and we knock because we have a need. But more so, we need to know how our needs are going to be met. See, I love this thing that uh, there's, this, there's this American psychologist named Abraham Maslow. 
right? He created this, this chart called the hierarchy of needs, of human needs. And what this chart essentially portrayed was different things at different levels, ranging from physiological needs to safety needs, love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization. And Abraham Maslow's theory on this was if you failed to really reach any one of these needs, if you failed to meet any of these needs, your survival rate was going to be was going to become lower or your quality of life was going to be lower. So it's, it, it, he really did do a good job at looking at the human and saying, there are things that we need provided for us. There are things and there are needs and wants that we have in our life that we need to find, that we need to ask someone for, that we need to seek out, that we need to knock on a few doors and see which one's going to open and give us these things. But the question that we're left with with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs is this. Who's going to give it to us? How are we going to go about this? And we can go to our teachers, we can go to our parents, we can go to politicians and celebrities and sometimes even our pastors and everything else. And at the end of the day, they can point us in the right direction, but they won't be able to provide these things a lot of times. But what this passage that we're going to look at is saying is that God is the one who provides this for us. Read with me Matthew 7, 7 through 11. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? That's beautiful. Because right there, he's telling us, hey, we're God's children. He looks at us as his children. He's our Father. How much more so is he going to give us good things so long as we ask him for these things? And that's what's so shocking about this statement. Here's, here's point number one. Know that God hears you. Sometimes we ask for things and it's not given to us. We feel like someone isn't actually hearing us when we're asking for these things or we're seeking out answers and we're trying to find out what door is going to open for us and we feel like no one's there. But what you can be really sure on is that God hears you. And because he hears us and considers us to be his children, he's going to respond to our requests. And that's what's shocking, that the God of the universe, this grandiose person, this grandiose being, who is over everything, who created everything, compared to him were minuscule little dots, still hears us and cares about us enough that he is going to give us those things that we ask for. Here's the caveat. What makes this statement so shocking is that we're going to receive whatever we ask for some of the time. Because a lot of times what happens is that what we're asking for, what we think might be a need or a good thing, is actually a fleshly desire. And here, here's, here's what I mean. Our heart can deceive us into thinking what we're asking for is good. If we go to Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his deeds. God completely understands where you are. He does hear you. And he wants the best for you. He wants to give you good and perfect gifts. That's what it says in James. However, if we're looking at our heart and saying, well, I want this because of this, or I want this because of this, and you're deceiving yourself into thinking that something is good for you when it's not, he's not going to give you that thing. So, so what, what are some of those things that we ask the Lord for a job, a spouse, wealth, a home, influence? This can go on and on and on and on and on. But again, the question is, why are we asking for them? What's your heart behind this thing? I think James does a really good job in chapter 4, 1 through 3. It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So yes, God does hear us and God does want to provide for us. But God also cares about the motive behind why we're asking. Know that God cares about our motives. 
He wants you to come to him. He wants you to ask him for things. But if you're not going to ask him for anything that has to do anything good for you, or you're asking him out of some type of selfish ambition, or you're asking him because of some type of malice, or whatever it is that you have going on that's bad inside your heart, he's not going to go into this and give in to whatever it is that you want just so that you can appease your fleshly desires, because that wouldn't be good for you. That wouldn't be bettering for you. That would not be good part of that would not be the good part of sanctification for you. He gives us things to help us through situations. He gives us things so that we can further glorify his name. He gives us things so that we can help others who are in need as well. Yes, he's going to give us what we ask for, so long as those things are coming from a good and pure area. Behind every request, we have to check our motive. So then this this is what we really comes down to. How do we check our motives? How do we check that what we're asking for is of pure intention? How do we check all these things? You can do this by asking the why question until you come to your authentic why. What do you mean, Sam? Let me give you an example. Me and my wife want our own home. Why? Because we want a place for our family to continue growing. Why? Because we want a place where our, where our kids' friends can come over and our friends can come over. Why? Because we want to love on others and disciple those we minister to. Why? Because that is what God has called me and my wife to do for the kingdom of God and to glorify him. That's my authentic why. Am I trusting that the Lord is going to provide for me in this? Yes. Am I also understanding that when that time comes for me to own my own home, that he's going to give us everything we need to attain and sustain that? Yes. Why? Because the Lord gives good things. He just wants to make sure that your motive behind it is also good. That's a really, really big caveat because a lot of times you're going to ask yourself, well, why do I want this? Maybe you currently live in an apartment and you want a house, but why? Maybe you have a decent job that pays all your stuff, but you want a job that pays you triple. Why? Maybe you want a spouse. Is it just because you see other people that have, that have a spouse and you want that same type of relationship and you're jealous of them? Or is it because you actually want to build a life with someone and glorify God through that relationship? Maybe you want filet mignon, but you have a perfectly good cube steak in front of you. That's going to satiate your appetite. Yes, even down to the simplest thing sometimes. We can ask God for all the things that we need and God wants to provide those things for us. He truly does, especially when it comes to the physical needs. He wants to show you that he does provide these things for us. That's why he's called Jehovah Jireh. He provides for his people to show them that he is there and he is attentive to their needs. But I think there's something further here. Because if you go over to Luke chapter 11, which is the one that parallels Matthew 7 in our passage, Jesus gives the same example, but he's really focusing more on the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that the greatest gift that you could ever ask for from the Lord is that of the Holy Spirit. Which then kind of points to this. There are good things that God wants to give us that are in the spiritual realm that have nothing to do with the physical realm. So that means that we have to know what spiritually good things to ask for. Yes, God is going to provide the physical things that we need and sometimes the physical things that we want, but he wants us to come to him for those spiritual things. What are those spiritual things? Those spiritual things are going to be the things that are going to help his kingdom grow. Those spiritual things are going to be the things that help help us, one another, help each other grow and encourage each other and become better and be able to bring more people into the fold and disciple one another and see the church grow. So what are some of those things? Holiness. Purity, righteousness, discernment, wisdom, understanding of God's word, boldness, kindness, joy, peace, love, the salvation of others. These are spiritually good things that God wants to lavish on us. But unless we start asking, seeking, and knocking for these things, he's not going to give it to us. So I think it's, I think it's time that we start changing our mindsets from the physical to the spiritual. Yes, I understand that we need all these different things, but when, you're, but when you truly look at how the Lord has always provided for you in some way or another on your physical needs, then you can very well understand that he's always going to provide for you. 
And what you should be asking him for are these spiritual things that are going to help you grow and help you edify one another. These are huge. And when we really start to focus on this, we transcend this physical world. We transcend all these material things that we're constantly asking for. And we really start becoming gospel-oriented, Jesus-oriented, and kingdom-minded so that we can really push and advance the gospel and carry out the good commission of Matthew 28. Here's what I want to leave you guys on. Because I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the greatest spiritual need that every single one of us has that every single person needs to ask for. Know that the greatest thing we could ever ask for is salvation. Romans 10, 11 through 13 says, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. The one spiritual need that we all have is salvation from the Lord. Why? Because we are all spiritually dead without him. Without the Lord in our lives, we don't even, we don't even know that we can even go to him. We don't even know that there is, there is a king out there that is willing to lavish his children with every good and perfect gift and provide every need that they have up to and including the forgiveness of their sins. Your sin taints your life and makes you spiritually dead. But the salvation that God offers through Jesus Christ, his son, who died on the cross and paid for your sin and resurrected on the third day to give you eternal life, that is the greatest thing, that is the greatest good thing that God could ever give to us in our lives. And it's there for the taking, free of charge. And he willingly gives it to everyone who asks for it. The question is, are you asking for it? Are you seeking for it? Are you knocking on that door for it to be opened? And if you're not, what steps are you taking to do that? If that's you today, I want to lead you through a prayer. So if you bow your heads with me and close your eyes. And this, is, this isn't a prayer to me. This isn't a prayer to God. This is a prayer to God. It's not to man. Um, and this is just a conversation that's starting that relationship with him and starting to be able to ask him for these spiritual things and, these, and, and most of all for salvation. But if it's the recognizing of your sin. It's the recognizing that you need a Savior. You cannot pay for this on your own. Romans says that the wages of sin is death and that the only one who was ever able to pay for this was Jesus Christ with his blood. If this is you, if this is where you are today, I want to invite you to truly look at the cross of Christ. Truly look at his cross and say, this is something that I want. This is something that I need in my life. I need the forgiveness of my sins. I need a new life. I need a new leaf to be turned. I don't want to continue living in the life that I was living. And I want the spiritual things that the Lord has to offer me because of who he is. If this is you, all you have to do is just start that conversation with him. Reach out and call on his name and ask to be saved and just give your life over to him for him to do whatever he will with it. Lord, we thank you for those who may be reaching out to you in this moment, Father God. We thank you for those lives that are going to be saved, Father God. We thank you for the payment that your son made on the cross and covering our sins with his blood and giving us eternal life so that we could be with you. We thank you for all the good things that you give us in our life. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Young adults, we love you guys. We'll catch you next week.